Welcome to The Ovation Show, where we're discussing the healthcare crisis in America. We're bringing partners, colleagues, clients, and business owners together to discuss solutions and innovations that are bringing a higher quality of care to employees while reducing their out-of-pocket costs. We're also reducing the employer costs and giving them more transparency and control. We're live today in the Work Innovator Studio, where Work Innovators is amplifying the voice of business at the VentureX Castle Hills in the realm. And today we're going to discuss innovation in, the, in healthcare, uh, particularly surrounding telehealth, telemedicine, and virtual care. Um, first of all, I want to introduce my co-host today, Nelson Griswold, all the way from Nashville, Tennessee. Thanks for coming in, Nelson. I'm excited to be here, Dan. So those that don't know, Nelson wrote a book back in 2012 called Do or Die. And this was really about the broken healthcare system that we had. And it was really revolutionizing and really taking brokers that had a different mindset, you know, taking up arms to, to battle the bukas and battle insurance companies and give control back to employers that there is a way to control the cost. There is a way to control the care that employees are getting. And so Nelson, you, you know, you've been instrumental as a mentor to me and to the group of another 50 other brokers across the country and you know, over the last decade of just changing the way we deliver care. And so you know, I appreciate that. Um, but tell a little bit just about that revolution real quick so everyone understands where you're coming from. Well, the, the healthcare system for employers who are buying healthcare for their employees is incredibly status quo. Uh, it, nobody's happy with it, doesn't work well. Everyone will tell you they don't like it, uh, but the, the people in charge, the insurance companies and the insurance brokers will say there's nothing you can do about it. You can't control costs, you can't, quality is great. We know quality is variable, right? They're great doctors and they're, they're exceptional doctors and exceptionally bad doctors. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at is how do, we, how do we get rid of the middleman in healthcare, which is the insurance company, and connect employers with the providers directly so that the employers now have control both over both quality and cost. And it works. And when CEOs and CFOs discover that they actually can control the quality and cost of their health care, they get excited and they get engaged. But under the current system, they delegate it to a line manager in HR and they move on to things they can control or think they can control. So that's to where the revolution is happening. It's really about, I'll tell you really what to say, the, the key is waking up CEOs and CFOs and alerting them to the fact that they can control the cost of healthcare like they control the cost of everything else they purchase, right? It's the one item that they buy that they don't look at quality and they don't look at cost and they just blindly pay the bill. It's absolutely insane and that's what we're changing. And, uh, we were featured in Chief Executive Magazine a couple of years ago. In fact, you were in that article yeah. uh, in one of your CEO clients uh, looking at the, the results, which are remarkable. Companies are saving uh, 10, 20, 30 percent on their second largest line item and able to give the employees much higher quality health care, often at no out of pocket for the employees. That's revolutionary. And it's revolutionary, it's, you know, and we're seeing a lot of innovation and you know new things that are coming out to help us manage care, deliver higher quality care at a lower cost. And so when we're talking about innovation in the healthcare space, I think one of the, I, again, I'll go back to the OG, the, the the godfather of innovation in the healthcare space. To me, is going into telemedicine, which you know with COVID became this massive acceptance nationwide and globally. But we're well, lucky today. We have Michael Gordon. He is the founder. Um, of Teladoc, which is again, the, the godfather, the grandfather of uh, telemedicine. And so Michael, you know, looking at Teladoc, Teladoc was the starter of telemedicine. Right. And let's just go back when you started that, you know, what, what, where did that vision come from that's, hey, we can deliver care via phone virtually. Hmm. So there's actually a Texas route to how I ended up in the telemedicine space. So I'm a serial entrepreneur, um, but wasn't a healthcare guy. I'm climbing Kilimanjaro, which I funded five of my friends. And one of them was a medical doctor who was also an electrical engineer. And um, he had his telemedicine roots were this. The state of Texas in the 90s passed a law that said, if an inmate in prison wants to talk to a doctor, we have to deliver the doctor in 24 hours. So think about in the 90s, 
those of us who were not in a correctional facility couldn't get to a doctor in 24 hours. But our legislature in their brilliance said, we're going to let inmates have that. Um, and, and they tried all kinds of different things and nothing worked. And then Dr. Brooks, who had been sitting at NASA as a flight surgeon. Uh, so what do flight surgeons do? They monitor the astronauts in outer space. So kind of a little bit difficult for them to come see a doctor when they're sick, right? And, and so as an electrical engineer MD, when the state of Texas brought him in, he figured it out. He put the pieces together and said, okay, here's how, here's how we get doctors and patients and use telemedicine to do it. So now we're climbing Kilimanjaro. I've just sold a company for $122 million. And Dr. Brooks is thinking, wow, it's time for me to make some money. And so he's <laughs> telling me about this idea and I'm thinking, this is stupid, you know, uh, these are prisoners, you know, and, and who's gonna get in front of all this camera equipment and everything in the real world? And, and, and what was even worse was Dr. Brooks wanted to call it cyber medical services. Hmm. So, you know, if there's any robots or cyborgs out there, you probably <laughs> like the name, but the rest of us were like, no, not, but, but Dr. Brooks's idea was brilliant. And, um, and so what we did was we took it from all of the telecommunications um, that were available at the time. And, you know, now with our smartphones, you know, we can, um, we've got these cameras, we can immediately get onto a video call. Back then, mm -mm, nobody could do it. And so we messed around with that a little bit, but what we found was a telephone call. And you said a little bit earlier, 85% of the things that walk into a primary care doctor um, can be handled with telemedicine. And that's what we found out was telephone can handle a significant percentage of the things. And, and in the beginning, we were trying to do video and other things, but almost everything came in on telephone. And the surprising thing is, even today, with the simplicity of video, most calls still are just traditional still telephone. telephone. And so, you know, we took Dr. Brooks's idea and turned it into a company and changed the name from Cyber Medical Services to Teladoc. And uh, well, I remember there was you talk about the video and the phone. I remember there was an uphill battle too for a while. I mean, because we started working with you, we talked about it earlier. You know, early on, you when you guys just started, and I got introduced to Joel Ray and New Benefits, right. and so uh, we did a lot of work with Teladoc. And I remember there was the uphill battle. Some states wouldn't let, allow it, and then there was some states. Well, you can't do video; you can only do phone. And I think that even happened even in the beginning of COVID. Right. There's some that right. weren't allowing video. But what were some of the uphill battles that you had until you know? Again, fast forward to COVID suddenly everyone has it. In fact, they're clamoring for it. But what were some of the battles to get to where at sure. that point? Um, well, Teledoc, the, the first battle was in Texas. Uh, we built the model, we tested it for a couple of years, and I felt like we needed to get on the mainstream. And so Dr. Brooks, because of his role in the Texas Correctional, knew everybody on the board. So we called him and said, hey, we wanna come in and talk about what we're doing. And um, everybody who knows me knows that I can be really passionate and, you know, this is how we're going to change the world. And so I did this in front of the Texas board and they looked at me and they said, Mr. Gordon, if you build this company, you will go to prison. And Dr. Brooks, we're going to take your medical license and then you'll go to prison. And so, you know, that was sort of the beginnings of, OK, what is the real problem here? Why is it that? Dr. Jay Sanders created this idea in the 60s and it never got implemented because it seemed simple enough. Um, and it was it was the bureaucratic um, and governmental uh, barriers that had prevented companies from doing it. So our problem at Teladoc was to figure out how do we convince them? And we looked at the history, you know, some of so people had tried to do this in the past and they'd been really well funded and they'd gone in with their guns and lawyers and, and lost. Um, Anybody who's seen a podcast that I've done from my house, behind me, there's a little thing that my wife gave me kind of as a joke. It says judge, jury, and executioner. <laughs> and people think it's because I think I'm the judge, jury, and executioner. And it's to remind me of those boards of medical examiners because in the 50 states, they control the doctors. They have their own court system. And so if you're a doctor and you get called in by the Board of Medical Examiners, you don't win if you fight them. Um, they are truly judge, jury, and executioner. Oh, wow. And so, you know, what we did was we said, we've got to find compliant ways. Let's bring thought leaders in. Let's show them how we really will make 
their lives, their mm-hmm. physicians' lives, their patient lives in those states better. But you know, it was a it was a big battle. W- one state you can guess the um, the name of it hired an actor, and that actor's job was to um, call doctors. And in our particular case, it's two days before Christmas. Patient is crying on the phone. I'm, you know, my doctor's gone until after Christmas and I've run out of OxyContin. And I'm in so much pain and my family is, is destroyed now because I'm in pain and I need my OxyContin. And the physician who was a Navy Lieutenant um, in the reserves, um, pregnant female um, says, okay, look, I'm not going to write you a prescription for OxyContin because it doesn't work in our business model, but I will write ibuprofen. So that particular state filed charges on her. She's donating 50% of her time to um, free healthcare in that state. And the other half of her time she's doing in the Navy reserves and they still decide, and she's pregnant. And so we start going into negotiating sessions with them and we don't know that it's an actor until one day we're in a meeting, everybody's under oath and, and they say, well, our actor, and I went, wait, actor or patient? <laughs> and they said, well, it doesn't matter. What she did was illegal. And I go, yeah, well, hiring an actor to trick a doctor is also <laughs> illegal. And they said, we don't care. Remember judge, jury and executioner. And without specifically saying those three words, they were reminding me that they, you know, we aren't going to win. I called the major newspaper in that state and said, did you know your medical board is hiring actors to trick doctors? Two days later, front page article, um, they said, oh, we've decided we're not gonna push this anymore. So, I mean, that's how determined that some of the boards were that they were right, is that they thought it was appropriate to have tools like that to trick doctors and go out and ferret out. And and honestly, what they were the I think the foundation of what they were thinking about is we don't need telemedicine tools delivering oxycontin to patients. Mm-hmm. I get that they're right about it. Um, but what they were doing was that I mean the lady wrote a prescription for ibuprofen, and they decided that was good enough for them to go out and ruin her life. That makes no sense. That's crazy. You know, and we think about though now how convenient that care has become. You know, yeah. what that created now where it is more widely accepted and the doors it's opening. Nelson, you know, we talk all the time about now direct primary care, now virtual primary care. Where do you so you know, again, we're trying to rebuild the benefit system, the the employee healthcare system. Where do you see and what do you see happening from that virtual care perspective? Well, we have a huge problem in this country, and that problem is a lack of physicians. Uh, the, the medical schools have done a very good job of controlling their output, so doctors are paid relatively well, uh, certainly compared to attorneys. There are way too many attorneys in this country, and that's not a uh, philosophical or ideological or political statement. They can't make a living. They're, they're, uh, actually, uh, one law school had some students sue the school because they said, you graduate and you'll be able to get a job. They couldn't get a job. Mm-hmm. But doctors uh, are, are in short supply to the, to the extent you know, we're importing them from other countries. Mm-hmm. What we need is a doctor extender. And telemedicine provides that. Virtual care provides that. So I don't have to have a doctor in my county. I just have to have a telephone and I can access medical assistance through through uh, virtual care. Here's the other thing, though. <clears throat> Let's go a little bit deeper. One of the real problems in this country is doctors have been pushed out of their primary position in healthcare. 63%, I think was the number I saw recently, 63% of doctors now work for hospitals. Mm-hmm. Their job at the hospital is to drive more business for the hospital. I'm a capitalist. I understand incentives. They're following incentives, but they're bad incentives. So you have doctors now who, primary care doctors who work for the hospital, and part of their compensation is based on how many referrals they make to specialists in the hospital system, how many referrals they make to the testing uh, facilities, uh, the diagnostic testing facilities in the hospital. So their incentives are now uh, I would I would argue uh, misaligned. You've got surgeons 
who who are pressured to use the operating room when an ambulatory surgery center is more than sufficient and a lot less expensive because the hospital wants the revenue from the OR, which of course they do. The problem is we've the doctors are being consolidated with the hospitals. Uh, virtual care gives doctors, I think, more control uh, over their time so they don't feel as pressured to see 47 patients like the insurance company requires a doctor to see in one day. 47 patients. Doctors have told me, primary care doctors have told me, patient comes in, they want something from me. They're, they're not feeling well or they're hurt. I have five to seven minutes with them. And in that time, I, I have two choices. I can write them a prescription for a drug they may not even need, and I can write them a referral to a specialist. I don't have time to dig in and find out why they're sick. So virtual care expands a doctor's ability to see patients without having to run them through like cattle through a cattle chute. I think you said something too, when patients go in, they're there to see a doctor about something. And you mentioned earlier when we were conversing, Michael, that you know we're in a we're in a habit or we're in a system of, of sick care mm -hmm. and so what, what are the, i mean what are the solutions you're saying or what do you feel well about that? so think about it this way when we were young and starting college the smartest people in our classes were the ones that were going to go to medical school and um you know that's that's not arguable that they, you have to have the best grades, um, you have to work the hardest um, in some of the hardest classes. So then fast forward, they go through medical school and now they're in a situation like what Nelson said. So put yourself in this position where you're not getting much sleep, uh, stuff is coming at you so fast that you, 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 it's hard to keep up. Anybody in that situation, their efficiency starts going down. And, um, you know, is that what they signed up for? Probably not. You know, and, uh, some uh, physicians signed up because they thought they were going to make more money. It's hard to get through that difficult of curriculum with just that. Part of it is their passion for helping people stay well, but they're getting hit so hard, so fast that they can't keep up. So what's the solution to that? I mean, we want our physicians to be well paid because that inspires the best of the best to go there. Um, my solution is, let's take the front end load off. Why are there 40 plus people going in a day? Because everybody's sick. Why is everybody getting sick? So start answering that question and you get to the heart of what we're trying to do now. You know, what did we try to do with Teladoc? We tried to um, take the load off of um, the, expensive part of healthcare by just having a phone and a doctor. Um, now, what I think that we can do with the new company we're building, Recuro, is let's figure out ways to make sure that we treat the immune system so you don't get sick. And by not getting sick, less people are gonna come to the doctor and the doctor can start charging more for those, um, because I'm not gonna need to see a doctor once a year, now it's gonna be every five years because my immune system is winning almost every battle. And, um, you know, I have a personal story because my son, when he was eight years old, got diagnosed with stage four leukemia. Um, that is a brutal disease that takes three and a half years. Leukemia is in every fluid in your body. It's a cancer. So how do you get rid of that? Now, a lot of chemotherapy. And um, so us older guys, you know, if we get leukemia, it's really, it, it's a death sentence. Even in the younger kids, 20% don't make it. And so, but why did that happen? Can, can you stop it from happening? And that's the things that I think our scientist physicians and our entrepreneurs should be working on right now. And that's what we're doing with Recuro is we're saying, let's, Let's figure out what the things are that keep people healthy. And by keeping them healthy, we're going to loosen the light and the load on the, on the physicians. They can charge more now and we'll, and, and the, and the entire cost of healthcare, even though the physician may be charging more per visit, the entire cost of healthcare is going to go down because there's a lot less visits. You can turn that 40 into 10 or maybe less. And the doctor can spend 25 minutes with the patient and really figure it out um, now. But, 
but not $110 for the visit, but $250 for the visit. So it's worth the doctor's time. So I'm, I'm struck by something. We've been working, Dan has been instrumental in this. We're working on the supply side yeah. of healthcare. Yeah. Working to improve the quality of the care and, and lowering the cost of the care. You're talking about working on the demand side of healthcare, <laughs> right? So yeah. fewer people need healthcare, the cost for those people's healthcare is zero. Yeah. Right, if they don't need a doctor, they don't need healthcare, their cost couldn't be any lower because right. they're not consuming healthcare. They're consuming uh, perhaps well care, they're, they're, they're consuming wellness strategies, yeah, I hate right? I that word. Yes, I know. It's, <laughs> a lot it's, of people did it wrong. And it, so. uh, wellness, <laughs> wellness today, in fact, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Al Lewis has a $2 million prize mm -hmm. on the table mm -hmm. for any wellness company that can prove an ROI. Yep. They can't, nobody's claimed the dollars, yep. $2 million. But, but the, they're living a healthier lifestyle. So maybe they're mm -hmm. investing in supplements, maybe they're spending money on uh, gym memberships, whatever, but they're not spending it on hospitals and doctors because they don't need them. Yep. That's the way to lower the cost of healthcare to a payer, whether it's the employee or the, the consumer or the employer who's picking up the tab. Or, or by the way, we taxpayers for Medicare and Medicaid, mm -hmm. right? We, we, we reduce the demand for healthcare. Uh, mm -hmm. Then we want to make sure that it's the highest quality care that's being delivered to those who need right. it right. at the lowest cost. Um, so let me, I, I uh, actually know a number of the companies that you've brought into Recuro, right. um, one of them, uh, the uh, My Legacy, which was a Cleveland Clinic spinoff, yep. uh, deals with genetic and genomic um, uh, identifying uh, risks, uh, risk uh, stratification. How does genomic medicine or, or, or genetic uh, uh, risk management fit into the Recuro vision? Yeah, so it provides the baseline Genomics gives us the ability to specifically treat you, which may be different from how we treat you. Um, and um, it, genomics tells us that, that maybe both of you have exactly the same disease right now, but your genetics is gonna uh, react differently to a drug than yours. And so we can start being very focused on not testing and saying, oh, you're, you have an allergic reaction or, oh no, your immune system didn't uh, take this drug properly. We can now use genomics to specifically say, this one works for you and this one works for you. Not guessing, we know right off the bat. You talk about uh, Evercuro, uh, personalized, customized and personalized mm -hmm. medicine. Right. This is getting about as personalized as it mm -hmm. can be. Right. If you're right. actually treating the, the DNA Yep. Uh, in the person. Yep. But um, we're not treating the DNA, we're recognizing the proclivities right, right. from the DNA. Right. And so, um, but you know, that's a topic for another podcast because we will be doing that, not Recuro specifically, but, but um, you know, technology is getting there where we can gene splice and you know, there's some really cool things that we can do. Uh, but you know, st staying on the preemptive side of healthcare, the uh, the best medicine is still our own immune system. And we forget this over and over and over again. Uh, you know, stress is the worst thing that happens to us. So how do we avoid stress? How do we treat stress when we have it? And stress can be a lot of things. It can be really complex situ situations in our family life or work life, or it could be, we just ran a marathon. You know, people don't realize, okay, this person is very athletic. Okay, what are they doing when they go and do something like running a marathon? They're creating a lot of oxidative stress and and their body more than their body can specifically handle. There are actually ways of, of treating that, not with medicine, but you know, we know what oxidative stress is. We take antioxidants now mm -hmm. for that. And the, it, again, there's a perfect antioxidant now called molecular hydrogen and, and you know I'd say anybody listening just go do the research on it but um, it is a way that marathoners um, or uh, you know when we got COVID in our house um, 
the physician told uh, my wife, oh, take this many um, ibuprofens every day. And it's like, why? For, because um, COVID creates a lot of oxidative stress. Okay. Well, we're not going to, we're not going to take a handful of ibuprofens, you know, three times a day. And so what we did was we switched to the molecular hydrogen and used it. And, it, and um, you know, it, it w- you know, uh, Dan, uh, my family is all mountain climbers and, yep. and, uh, you know, you climb a mountain creates a lot of oxidative stress. So we do molecular hydrogen before and after, and there's no, none of that. So that's one of the clever little tools, but there's literally thousands of them. And so uh, there's a really good analogy I like to use, and that is our automobile, right? I'm an engineer, so I can handle this. If somebody says, you know, when in the stroke do you inject the fuel and when does the spark happen and how much pressure? So nobody knows that. They know that they get in their car, they press a button, they steer, they brake, they gas, right? Um, and uh, But think about how complex a car is. How often do you see a car on the side of the road because somebody didn't remember to fill up their gas tank? Or how often did the engine burn up because they didn't they waited too long to change their oil or um the the one that i really like is your tires so you know your tires wear out and at some point you have to change them if you don't you're going 80 miles an hour down the highway and you have a blowout there are going to be problems and that's what we do in our healthcare system we don't monitor the tread on our tires and we have blowouts Guess what? You have stage four cancer. That's how our healthcare system works. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing is we're saying, okay, we don't expect people to understand the biochemistry. We will do that for you. We're just going to tell you the tread's getting thin. Time to change your tires. You know, hey, change your oil or your engine will burn out. Um, Put gas in because that gauge is down now close to the E, right? And so those are the things that we in the healthcare community have to be able to deliver in the simplest form possible to the patients out there. That's preemptive healthcare. And um, by doing it, we take the load off the physicians because they're not going to see mm-hmm. those 40 a day. Um, and that's a good thing for the physicians. They may not think so now because they're making money from 40 a day, but let's do the supply demand thing and, um, and change that. Uh, but the other thing that I love about this is the things uh, that you do to s- inspire your immune system and stay healthy are the same things that you're going to do to increase your health span and live longer. And so it's not a magic pill. It's not work out and eat green vegetables. It's 25 or 30 things that you do on a regular basis that keep your immune system strong um, and keeping your immune system strong will keep you living longer. We've talked about your teledoc experience. How did, other than moving you into healthcare and your interest into healthcare, how did your experience with teledoc prepare you and uh, uh, inspire you to continue moving uh, in healthcare and what you're doing with Procuro? Yeah. So I stayed away from healthcare a little while after, after teledoc just because I didn't want to compete. Teledoc was my baby. Jason Gorvik was running it. He was doing a great job. And um, so I didn't want to be in a place where I would compete. And, um, but, you know, looking back at the things that we accomplished with Teladoc, they weren't the things I wanted to accomplish. So what did I want to do? The things that we're talking about now, you know, let's be preemptive. Let's, uh, let's find ways to make sure people don't get sick and therefore lower the cost of healthcare. Um, create the convenience. You know, there's a gas station on every corner nowadays. And so that's where you fill up your tank. We all know, go to Discount Tire or your favorite tire place to change your tires. And so let's find the simple ways that everybody can get this preemptive stuff. And so that's how you go from Teladoc into a Recuro. Um, Not here to compete with Teladoc right now. I'm here to add the next next generation. In the beginning, um, the... You know, there's several people in in uh, Rikiro who were early in Teladoc, and um, and you know we're all saying, okay, this is sort of a Teladoc 2.0. I think you talk about you know Teladoc and in, in any telemedicine, it's a reactive 
response. I mean, it, it, I get sick, I'm gonna call and get care. Mm -hmm. And you're now you're going in that preemptive, proactive side of it, of mm -hmm. we're going to get all, we're gonna help you figure out what you need to do to stay healthy so you don't have to use Teladoc or your other doctor. Right. So when you look at the big picture of, you know, whether it be employ, employer health plan, but just healthcare in general, mm -hmm. how do you see all of that playing, taking that preemptive, Gene genomic testing mm -hmm. where do, so i get the testing i get it all done where does that flow where does that go now and yeah. you know where's recuro seeing that what is the plan for that um we uh, we purchased a company that does home delivery of labs um a brilliant young south african lady named um allison who came to the united states with an idea and her idea was part of this sort of digital medical home. Let's make things less expensive by being able to deliver things into the home environment rather than doing them in the more expensive. Um, uh, sort of funny story. I don't, you guys don't have uh, fire ants in Nashville yet, mm -hmm. but we have yeah. them in Texas. <laughs> A lot of and, and, and they're brutal, you know? You don't want your kids to step in them because there's gonna be pain for a week. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a simple problem with a simple solution. And you go out in your front yard, you see this fresh mound, um, you go and get a teaspoon of whatever you use, you put it on there and the fire ants are gone. Um, problem solved. In healthcare, what we do is we call the Pentagon and they send F-16s and tanks. Um, and that's how we solve these problems. And um, it, we don't need to do it that way. What we need to do is we need to make sure that, we're, that we have the proper tools and we're preemptive, we stay ahead of the curve. Would you agree that the biggest challenge you're facing at Recuro is education of the consumer, the patient, the participant, however you want to yeah. describe them? Yeah, but um, yes, but if we if we make it our goal to educate the patient, we will not win. What we need to do is we need to provide the simplicity. Go back to my automobile example. Um, you know, we don't understand where the gas is in our tank or how it's getting from the tank to the um, engine. All we know is there's a gauge and when it gets to a certain point, it's time to go to the gas station. And there's a little sticker on our windshield that says the last time we changed our oil. Um, we sort of keep an eye on that. And so our responsibility in the healthcare community is not necessarily to educate. If somebody wants to be educated, great. The internet, we can help educate, whatever. Our responsibility is just to provide the simplicity tools to keep them healthy. <clears throat> so then my question is, how, what's your distribution model or distribution plan, uh, go-to-market plan? Yeah. How, are you, how are you getting Recuro out to the right people who can make the right decisions? Well, the, um, the reality is, if I had tried to do this pre-Teladoc, I never would have succeeded. But the, but the pandemic has created a situation where everybody knows telemedicine, and they shined a spotlight on me. And um, so we have been using that sort of Teladoc <coughs> tidal wave uh, to open doors. Um, the, the, when I was building Teladoc, there was a guy on my advisory board that everybody always asked, why is he there? His name is Buzz Aldrin. Um, he walked on the moon and people said, what does a guy who walks on the moon have to do with telemedicine? And I could have made up things like, well, if he's sick on the way to the moon, you know, we got to take care. <laughs> but, but that's not why I did it. The reason I did it was because there wasn't a person on the planet who wouldn't take his call opens doors, right? And, and the thing that we learn as young entrepreneurs is it's really hard to get doors open when, we have a new, when we're young and we have a new idea. Um, as, after we built something successful, it gets a little bit easier. And the bigger the thing is, the easier it gets. And um, so we've used that Teladoc tidal wave to open a lot of doors. And um, people will listen to us because we've been successful and so, we, it, you know, as long as that tidal wave lasts, we're going to utilize it. But um, as you know, Nelson, uh, Rikiro has grown phenomenally well, probably one of the fastest growing companies in the country right now. And, um, and we're going to do even better this year. And it's a lot of it is because 
John and myself and Michelle and Shelly and all the other people that were there in the very beginning of Teladoc are here and we're all thinking the same way. And, and, and we have the, the name brand and the reputation this time. Are you, are you distributing through employers primarily at this point or are you direct to consumer? Um, we are going through uh, employers just because, you know, could we go to direct to consumer? Yeah, but it would be really hard. Um, the reality is the, the, um, the senior decision makers in Fortune 50 companies are taking our calls and that's the place where we need to go because we can have the biggest impact. We talk all the time about data and getting data and, you know, it's great to have data, but you have to be able to do something with it. You know, what do you do with it? Data is just data unless you actually act, act yeah. upon it. Yeah. So if you're if somebody goes through a Curo and they're getting this genome testing and they're they're looking at they see what my proclivities are, they see what I need yeah. to be doing. What is there a Curo going to have a kind of a, a, I don't know, a structure where we have that data. We know we have the labs. Is there going to be, you know, we, we won't go from Teladoc where it's reactive, we're going to more of a proactive virtual primary care. Is that all going to be like a bundled up package where somebody can say, yeah. we have all your testing in your labs and now we're going to have a physician that's going to watch over you virtually? Yeah. Or, so remember that I've, I've said, you know, you can look at all the cool technology that we developed to build Teladoc. But as an engineer, what we did most importantly was we created efficiency. And, um, and so Recuro is not a telemedicine company per se. We are a digital medical home. And so I think data is the most important tool that we have right now. And the ability to store and deliver patient information to wherever the patient wants it to go is a critical element of our success. Um, you know, uh, why did uh, Steve Case start Revolution Healthcare? because he was taking his brother to, um, his brother was fighting cancer and um, he was taking him to all these different physicians and he was filling out the same paperwork over and over and over again. Now that's a data thing, why, why is that? That's a efficiency thing, um, you know, and it costs money every time you do it. It costs you money, it costs the company that's giving you that paperwork. So why can't we just transfer data? Uh, part of it is, um, a much more complicated computer question. You know, we were using a data structure called HL7 and we built Teladoc on it. And um, uh, there's a new one called Fire and it's it, it solves the data problem. No, oh, nobody knows how to use it yet, but everybody's going to be switching over the next couple of years. And we're building Rikiro on Fire. Um, sounds kind of funny, we're building. <laughs> 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 uh, so, um, but, the, the ability to uh, deliver data, uh, another thing that's happening right now is blockchain. And so, you know, how can you safely deliver data that um, significantly exceeds HIPAA standards? That's blockchain. And so I think, Dan, your uh, data is, is critical to what we're going to be doing in healthcare. And we're kind of lucky right now because this whole thing about new these new fire data structures is something that we're going to be able to do from the starting point. Um, whereas if say Teladoc or a company like Teladoc, they're gonna have to switch to fire, um, partly because there's mandates and partly because uh, the, us younger companies are gonna be, we're gonna be in a significant point of advantage. But for me, starting and building this thing is a million dollars. For them to switch is gonna be tens of millions of dollars. So I mean, we're talking about digital medical records. Part of the ACA was that whole digital medical records being shared and being available. Uh -huh. So do you think that taking the, the data you have and eventually you'll be able to take everyone else's doctor records, hospital records, and be able to combine it in the cloud somewhere where it is, you know, just like your credit report, you know, which is, which was the goal after ACA, yeah. but we haven't seen that really happen. Do you see? Yeah. The historical way we've done this is, is in a paper folder in a file cabinet in a doctor's office. Right. It's hard to move that around. Um, and we started thinking about um, digital data 20 plus years ago but it still hasn't been implemented yet. Right. It's going to get implemented over the next couple of years. Data, and and where does that data belong? Does it belong in your primary care doctor's office? Our belief is 
because we said digital medical home, we believe that it is controlled by the patient, not on a thumb drive or not on their home drive, but in the cloud in a super secure place um, that, uh, you know, no hacker can crack. But, but then it gets delivered on demand in standard formats to wherever that patient needs it. It makes life a lot, of le a lot easier. I love it. Nelson, what kind of impact do you see on that? Well, I, I think the, the overall data question extends into healthcare too. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been doing some research for a keynote I'm doing for a group of independent physicians later this spring. Uh, and suicide is a huge issue in, in the physician community. It's, some studies say it's double the, the suicide rate of, of other Americans. One of the stressors, one of the biggest complaints doctors have is that they spend more time in front of a screen tapping keys than they do looking into the eyes of their patients and having a conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as, as we can start to automate that process, if we can start, if data can become our friend instead of our foe when it comes to healthcare, because I've been to those doctor's offices too, and I get so tired of having to fill out a new form every time. It's the same yeah. information. Nothing's changed. Uh, it, so I do think that, that this focus on data and how we standardize it, how we distribute it, obviously safe, safely, uh, and then how we can help the doctors. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a physician practice that came out of Silicon Valley, and I'm, I can't recall the name of it. It was backed by some Google execs, et cetera. The doctors go into their examination room. They never touch a keyboard. They just have a conversation with their patient. Mm -hmm. There's a microphone in the room and there's a medical transcriptionist who gets the recording and puts mm -hmm. it into the EHR for the, for the physician. Because typing into a keyboard, typing into a computer, it's not that doctor's highest use. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be thinking in terms of, you said it earlier, efficiency. How do we create more efficiency in healthcare? One reason a lot of doctors are leaving healthcare is that they're tired of having spent all their time yeah. typing into an EHR. Right. So I do think that the whole data question is bigger than just uh, the, the medical record, but it's how do we see data and inter interface with data on a, mm -hmm. on a daily basis when you're in healthcare? Yeah. Yeah. So look, I mean, we, I, it seems like all three of us agree. Data yeah. is, is is a critical element in solving the problem. Um, but but again, you know, I think taking the load off the physician. It, mom told us this. I guarantee you, everybody listening, their mom said this: an ounce of prevention. I don't even have to finish mm -hmm. it. You In don't. healthcare, it's not a pound; it's a ton. Yeah. You know, if if you can stay healthy, then you're. Uh, you know, do it on the uh, prevention side, not on the cure side. And, um, and, but our healthcare system doesn't do that at all. And the, you know, there's cottage industries, we call it wellness. I hate that word, but, um, the, and then there's the, um, the, uh, vitamin and supplement industries that, you know, they're all working towards this thing, but it's not a, it's not a magic pill. Again, it's 20, 30 things that you have to do on a regular basis. You won't get sick or your probability of getting sick is significantly lower. And then the doc and then when you do, the doctors aren't weighted down and, and they can focus on you. And, and by not being weighted down, the doctors can think like they did when they were undergraduates and they can spend time with you and go, okay, let's think about this a little bit. I know how to solve this problem. Um, uh, rather than just getting hit so fast by so many slaughter balls that all they can do is get hit. Yeah, I think everybody remembers the show House, Dr. Mm -hmm. House, uh, Hugh Laurie played the, the physician who was the specialist in, in identifying rare disorders and uh, uh, IDing what was going on in a patient nobody else could, could identify. House couldn't do that, Dr. House couldn't do that if he was seeing 47 patients a day. Yeah. <laughs> He had to have time to sit back and think, to ponder, do a little research, uh, have conversations with his colleagues. And this is, we've turned doctors, uh, uh, certainly primary care internists, into automatons. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's gotten so bad that, that we've now, we're using nurse practitioners yeah. as, ex, as physician extenders. Yeah. And I, this is not a, a knock on 
nurses and nurse practitioners, but they're not doctors. Yeah. And and you know there are a lot of those at eighty five percent of ailments and complaints that that can readily be solved. And nurse practitioners are probably very good at that. Yeah. Uh, but but the doctor, by the way, is still seeing forty seven patients. Mm -hmm. Yep. He just has nurse practitioners seeing another 47 mm -hmm. so he can pay the bills and make a make a few dollars. Yep. Uh, I, I, I go keep going back to the efficiency piece. Uh, you're doing two things at Recuro. If, if you can create more efficiency and if you can help reduce the demand mm -hmm. for health care. Right. And those two things would they won't solve the health care problem because we still have a supply side uh, issue, but it would certainly uh, ameliorate the the problem yep. and one of one of my clients uh, advisor out of uh, San Antonio uh, healthcare advisor uh, said to me yesterday two days ago uh, I, I'm telling my client that this proposal is good for the humans in your company and your company's bottom line mm -hmm. And right. I shared that with uh, another client yesterday, and I said, I love that. She goes, that's fantastic. I said, you know why it's fantastic? She goes, yes, it humanizes healthcare. Mm -hmm. Humanizes what we're, this is about people. Yep. And if, if you can refocus with Recuro and other like-minded folks, refocus from a reactive, mm -hmm. sickness-focused fo uh, 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 healthcare system to the proactive, health focused system that that you envision i mean that's transformative yeah for the humans yeah we right. we agree yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so i had i had a question i was doing a little research uh for 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 this uh podcast you once said i like audacious things that will change the world <laughs> yeah i do uh in addition to what Recuro is doing what other audacious changes would you like to see in healthcare? Or do you think need to happen in healthcare? Well, you know, I'm going to in in the healthcare space. I'm going to stay focused on what Recuro is doing. But I, the um, you know, it occurred to me that uh, my wife is a really good singer and songwriter, and and so my brain often goes back to kind of thinking about songs. And there's an old song that says, um, I want a new drug. Hmm. Huey Lewis, Lewis one, the news. That, <laughs> one that makes me feel the way I feel. And then in his version, it's like, it's a love song. So one that makes, me, and, and so in my particular case, you know, I was lucky in the, in the nineties, um, I knew something about the, um, this thing that was new called the internet. And I built one of the first internet companies and it changed everything. You know, we, we changed how phone calls are made. We changed how people watch TV and it's a drug. It's a Huey Lewis kind of drug. Right. And, um, and then, uh, Teladoc, right. And so, you know, you, you start getting addicted to, okay, what, what can I do that changes something else or something else or something else? And, uh, so, you know, I, from healthcare, Rikiro is it because I'll, I tell young entrepreneurs all the time that um, remember the movie Up, the dog yeah. was all it would go squirrel and run yeah. that way, squirrel run that way, and, and you know if, if you do that as an great entrepreneurs are also very creative people, and so the entrepreneur who stays focused accomplishes the objective. The entrepreneur who doesn't, you know, they chase squirrel that way, that way, that way, that way, and a year later they're still in the same place. They've made no progress. Right. And so you, you have to be focused. And so right now, if you say healthcare, the only thing I'm going to do is be Recuro preemptive. Um, but I'm lucky enough to be part of, a, of another entrepreneurial endeavor called Back to Space, which is sort of solving the supply side. Um, uh, you know, why is it that our generation produced more scientists and engineers than any other generation? Why is it that our generation uh, created more science, technology, engineering, math, medicine, music than the entire history of mankind combined. So take 35,000 years of history, every accomplishment, one generation, one and a half, the, the, uh, the uh, baby boomers and the Gen Xers together um, 
produced, now it's going on two times more science, technology, engineering, math, music than 35,000 years added up together. Um, we're not doing that anymore. We did a really good job of changing the world and then we raised, we raised the millennials. And what, what are they doing? They're sitting upstairs at 35 years old playing <laughs> video games in their parents' house, right? And so how do we change that again? And that's the goal of Back to Space. Let's find ways to inspire people like we were. How do I change the world? I mean, maybe it's as a capitalist, maybe it's not, but how do I do things that change the world? And, and uh, so that's what we're doing in that one. Um, and, then, and then, you know, as, uh, as a mentor, you get to find all kinds of other little things that you can help people do. But. You know, you, you said something that, that resonated with me uh, when you talked about how the internet has changed so much because it, it, it's a structural change. It gave us a new structure mm -hmm. on which to build a new way of watching television, uh, a new way to communicate, VOIP, which I know you were involved in in uh, early phases of, of, of VOIP, voice over internet protocol. Teladoc was a structure, yeah. right? It moved medicine from face to face, brick and mortar, to, to, to digital, to yeah. electronic or digital. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is my iPad, most telemedicine is, most telehealth is happening on the phone. My daughter, for instance, uh, is seeing, seeing a counselor. It's on the phone. She doesn't use an iPad or, or FaceTime, but it's available. Yeah. So if I have a rash, the doctor may say, let me see that rash and we mm -hmm. can do that. Mm -hmm. So it's actually video does extend the, the physician's capabilities uh, uh, with, with virtual care. Uh, how do you see Rocuro as a structure uh, or, or maybe you're building a structure that Rocuro is a part of mm -hmm. that will change the role? Who, who was it, uh, Archimedes? He said, give me a long enough lever and, no, I'll, and I'll, I'll move the world. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's but it's not the leverage. How close is the fulcrum yeah. to to the object you want to move? Yeah. That really is is the issue. So we're pushing the fulcrum closer, maybe. Mm -hmm. But but how do you see the structural aspect yeah. here yeah. as an engineer? It's, how do you yeah. break it down to that yeah. structure? I, so remember, I need to deliver simplicity. I don't need um, our patient members to understand how an internal combustion engine works. And so the, the way I'm going to do this is uh, in about a year, everybody who's a member of my um, company, uh, we're going to send a box twice a year. And it's really simple. Take a little clip of hair, prick your finger, put a couple dots on this pad, um, pee in a cup, you know, do, we'll have specific things. And it'll come back to us, um, it'll go to your home via UPS, FedEx, whatever. Um, it'll come back to us and and we'll know, run these tests on you and these tests on you. Why? Because of genomics, we've talked about that. Um, so we're capturing, you're capturing the specimens, we're running tests. Now we can see where you are. Are you trending up? Are you trending down? And um, we don't expect you to understand the uh, idiosyncrasies or the biochemistry of what's happening. All we're gonna do is we're gonna say, Nelson, you're trending up on this thing. Here are the things that you ought to do to trend back down. And, um, and so that's things that would be pre-cancer, pre-heart disease, pre-diabetes, all of those things that you can do, the ounce of prevention rather than the pound of cure or ton of cure. And so um, we do this twice a year and we start seeing, okay, you're trending up. But the other thing that we can do behind the scenes now, because we're capitalists, is we can say, um, there's these guys named actuaries and they're really good at math. And then we can say, okay, look at all of our data and tell us who every time we give them a test, we show they're trending up, they trend back down based on the advice we give them. Now we have a subset of people that are willing to do whatever it takes to stay healthy. They don't need to know, they just know, okay, I'm gonna put my 92 octane gasoline, I'm gonna change with synthetic oil, I'm going to get new tires. Um, so we're just giving them the tools so they know when to do things and how to do them. And some people won't. 
Some people still have blowouts. Some people still run out of gas. Some people don't change their oil. Um, we can't help those people. But the ones that are willing to do just the tiny bit of ounce mm -hmm. of prevention, um, we're going to give them the tools so they know what to do. Not guessing, I just found out recently um, uh, that I don't process vitamin, uh, I don't pr process zinc. I take zinc all the time and it doesn't. <laughs> and so, you know, the, um, there's this really great local physician named Jeff Gladden and um, he did some testing on me. He goes, look, you don't process zinc. You need to do this so the zinc will come into your body better. And so now, you know, the world has changed for me. And, and those little simple things. So you may be buying vitamin D or, or zinc and your personal physiology isn't handling it. So those are the things that will, because right now we're guessing, we're going, okay, my friend lost weight on this diet, so I'm gonna try it, doesn't work for me. Um, my friend um, used this to help him uh, stay more alert. Um, you know, we'll give you the specifics without having you have to go back and do um, high school biology or God forbid, forbid organic chemistry. You know, the boon or the bane <laughs> of all of all med students. Yeah, I'm thinking too, Dan. You were asking about virtual care and the impact, the information that you're generating. The the I'll say data, but it's really knowledge. It's the knowledge and in, in insight that you're generating through your baseline testing that you're doing twice a year. Mm -hmm. uh, you one of the uh, you're not you're wearing a real watch, but I see a lot of people with Apple watches, mm -hmm. um, and there are other Fitbits and other wearable uh, yeah. devices that can relay to a Recuro mm -hmm. or to a physician uh, certain. Uh, metrics and, and data about the individual. I mean, there's at some point, there's this opportunity, the data you've got mm -hmm. can also be provided to the doctor who now knows I need to check on my patient who maybe not as compliant as I'd like him to be. Right. And so he calls Nelson and says, it's not Dan, it's Nelson. <laughs> um, you know, are, are you, are you doing this? Right. Or I'm, I'm noticing that we're not getting any data that you're out walking. You know, what, what's going on? Did you hurt your foot or something? You can't walk? It's like, well, no, I'm just lazy. Mm -hmm. Okay, get out and walk. It's important. Yeah. Right? So you, you, you're expanding, basically building an ecosystem mm -hmm. where that data is usable and actionable by not just the patient, but by caregivers or right. uh, a, an accountability partner. Mm -hmm. If you want to, if you want to take it out of the physician's hand, but, but also a physician when it's, when it's uh, called for. I think that that really expands the utility right. of what we're talking about. Well, I think, you know, if, if your doctor tells you something, it carries a lot of weight. There's a, a great story in the beginning of Teladoc, one of our uh, test patients. We had a group of 200 that we tested for a couple of years. And um, one of them was, um, he woke up, he had a really important meeting and his foot was asleep. And his wife said, you know, you need to go get that checked. And he's like, look, I'm really busy today. Um, and then he, when he was driving in, he thought, oh, I'm gonna test this teledoc thing. So he calls in, the doctor says, turn around, go to the emergency room right now. So his wife had said, go to the doctor. You know, it's like, okay, tomorrow, honey. Um, but when the physician said, stop what you're doing, go to the emergency room. Well, it turns out he was in early stages of a stroke. You know, they, they caught it. They treated him, he lived. And, and the physician on, on staff said, you're lucky you came in. You probably wouldn't have made it through the day. Wow. And so, you know, that's one of those things where, um, you know, okay, my foot's asleep. My foot's been asleep lots of times in my life. You know, um, what's the big deal? He just didn't know all of the biochemistry and other medical things that um, that, that physician was able to catch. And even listening to his wife who had a, you know, the gut feeling that our spouses have. Um, well, it's the, it's the accessibility too. just struck me it, going to that. Can we even get an appointment yeah, yeah. with the doctor today? Yeah. Maybe not, yeah. but, but can I get a, a telehealth doctor on it? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And now you've got that immediate access that you could spell the difference between life and death. In this case, it could well have. One thing goes yeah. back to accessibility you're talking about is, you know, if we have, if you have, if doctors see 47 patients that day to meet this quota, now we can have a way to pull off 23 of those 
because they're healthier, they're taking care of themselves, they're being proactive, they're using the, the tools that we're giving them, that frees up the doctor to have more time for the patients that really right. need it. And so I think, you know, in closing, I mean, cause I know you have to go too, um, you know, we talk about things, the data is the key. We need to get data. And to do that, you know, a simplistic solution that people will use, which you're creating, um, and then just being proactive and individualistic. You know, make right. it about that one person and let that let them get the data. And then what do we do with it? And, and just giving the people the tools and the doctors the tools to, to care for people and have well care, not just sick care. And I mean, and that, that ultimately goes into the big picture that we talk about, Nelson, is, yeah, we're taking care of people. They're healthier. That's a healthier workforce. But also at the same time, it is reducing the employer's health care costs, ultimately, which is what you know the next gen mastermind is about, too. So I think this whole thing comes together. I'm really excited about what Recure Health and what it's bringing. So yeah, uh, me too. <laughs> this is awesome. I can't wait. Yeah, we'll have to do like in six months, do another one, and have an update of where where it's sure. at, and looking yeah. forward to how we can bring it to all the all the people in the mastermind and the employers we're working with around the country. So with that, I just want to say thank you to Michael Gordon for coming in, um, mm -hmm. and Nelson Griswold. Uh, it's great to have everybody in town and we're going to uh, brave the icy roads today and head back out. Uh, I want to thank all our sponsors, Craig Shelley, Beverly Hills, Fine Watches, uh, Success North Dallas, where Bill Wallace has been connecting people for 35 years, and TBX Employee Benefits. Employers turn to TBX to provide a modern, seamless, and hassle-free self-enrollment experience for core and voluntary products aimed at educating, not selling to employees. In fact, not only can employers provide a user-friendly, mobile responsive technology solution full of dynamic communications, professional videos, and a data-driven decision support tool, they can do so at no cost to them. That's right, with TBX, there are no setup fees or PEPMs, and there's no need to replace existing technology, as we can easily snap onto any existing HRIS and HCM systems. Plus, the enrollment experience is ready in just 30 to 45 days or less, and data files are properly formatted and delivered to carrier and payroll destinations quickly, securely, and accurately. We look forward to helping you accomplish what others can't, a state-of-the-art technology platform for open enrollment, new hires, and qualified life event processing that's simple to implement and maintain. A partnership that's a perfect fit. That's TBX.